Hello, my name is Chris Keating and I'm the State Capitol Bureau Chief at the Hartford Current. Today we're going to be discussing the accomplishments and the failures of the 2016 legislative session with two legislators from the Connecticut General Assembly. They are State Senator Kevin Whitkos of Canton, who is the Deputy Senate Leader, and State Rep John Hampton of Simsbury, who is in his second term. Uh, both of these gentlemen are, are veterans at the State Capitol and uh, they were at the Capitol even before they're holding their current positions. So uh, today we'll talk about a, a series of topics, including uh, the state budget, uh, the bond package, second chance. Uh, and the first thing I wanted to ask them was on the state budget. Um, I think both of you obviously had some concerns about the state budget, to say the least. And um, maybe each of you, starting with Kevin, uh, the state budget that has been passed, obviously, uh, on a largely ma uh, majority caucus vote, even though it wasn't 100% bipartisan. But uh, Kevin, you could take us through that first about your concerns about the state budget. Sure, Chris. Uh, the, the concerns with the state budget, first of all, no Republican supported the state budget. Uh, the budget did cut spending from the previous uh, budget. However, this is going back to a budget that we voted on four times in, in one year uh, because it, from day one, it was never a budget that was good for the state of Connecticut. It wasn't good for the taxpayers. It wasn't good for the business community. It wasn't good for uh, the grandchildren that are soon yet to be born that's going to bearing all the costs. Uh, from the Republican side of the aisle, we said that unless there's structural changes in this budget, we cannot support something because it's going to be uh, a large, massive uh, deficit followed by a huge tax increase. And that's the cycle that we've been going through for a number of years. And uh, people have got to the, gotten to the realization that unless we control our spending uh, and do so systematically, we're going to be back in the same boat. So there were no structural changes in the budget, therefore it didn't receive any Republican support. And there were simple uh, things that we asked for come back up with a spending cap. We, we should put in a constitutional spending cap. We, the, the voters overwhelmingly asked for that after the income tax was passed. We want to put a cap on bonding because right now uh, the governor is, uh, this governor, Governor Malloy, has bonded more money than any governor has in the history of this state in his short term in office. I think we're up to almost $2.9 billion in this year alone. We wanted to have a vote on the union contracts of the state employees because that doesn't happen right now. If it arrives at the General Assembly, if it's not acted upon in 30 days, if we're in session, it automatically is approved. That never happens in any town council or chamber in the municipalities. That's why our, I think our municipalities manage their budgets better than the state budget does. And there's a few other things, but uh, for the most part, because the budget contained no structural changes, it didn't have any Republican support. John, um, a, a, your thoughts on the budget, and B, your, your thoughts on the structural changes that Kevin just mentioned. Well, um, it's great to be with you. Thank you, and Senator Ritkos, and to echo Kevin's uh, remarks, Connecticut keeps operating crisis to crisis, you know, two years to two years, and we're just operating with short-term fixes, and there are no long-term solutions. We didn't have to get to this place uh, of where we are in cutting and slashing and the last two cycles of raising taxes because we weren't doing any long-term strategic planning. We did it at the municipal level. Our municipalities are trying to, uh, to budget uh, responsibly. Um, we're being unfair to them. We're being unfair to our citizens by not putting in the structural reforms that Kevin mentioned like spending cap, like bonding, uh, capping our bonding. I put in a bill this year to, to cap our bonding, got no attention at all. Um, and we're just doing short-term uh, fixes without uh, looking down the line 10, 15, 20 years for the future of our state. So um, it wasn't a banner year for us. On opening day, I, I could be wrong. Refresh my memory. What, wasn't there mention of a bonding cap on opening day? I thought I, I, thought I recalled was. that. Well, there was a mention of a bonding cap. There was a mention of a lockbox on transportation. You know, and, and this is from the governor and the president pro tem of the Senate and the Speaker of the House. If they wanted to, we could have those things in place right now, but they did not want to enact these types of pieces of legislation because if you control the chambers, you control the agenda, and you control the votes. Uh, so it, for me, it was uh, empty speak from the leadership on the majority side, that they didn't get done what they said they wanted to get done and what the people demanded to get done. And I think the spending cap has met twice now, commission, the spending cap commission, if that. Yeah. Um, and uh, so it's very frustrating. Tell me also about ECS cuts. There was uh, a whole series of proposals, ECS up, down, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, for both of you, explain a little bit about where that ended up. Um, there were multiple iterations of where that was going. Go ahead. Well, uh, 
the first, uh, the first thing any legislator does is look at the runs of ECS because that's where the most money that our communities get from the state. And if they see that their community is getting less money, then obviously there's, they push back and say, I, I can't support this because my community is getting uh, less dollars. Uh, this year what happened in the cycle was uh, many of the communities I know that I represent, in addition to Simsbury, uh, they have, uh, according to the formula, the equalized uh, cost sharing formula, uh, they had to go above the cap, if you will. So it was over 100% funding in order to get some money because of the wealth considered in the, in the different communities. And what happened at the state level this time was they reduced everybody to 100% and then took 1 to 1.5% uh, off the top of that. So some of the communities got hammered uh, with the dollar amounts and loss of education dollars. But the interesting thing is, and it's not happening in Simsbury because the boards here get along so well and they're very professional in the work that they do, but in other communities, the education money was cut, and in conjunction with that, the state said, well, we have this thing called an MBR, minimum budget requirement. So it says that you have to spend the same amount of money on education this year as you spent last year. So the state relieved the municipalities of that burden, saying, if you got cut in ECS this year, you don't have to make it up. But then, in what was called the, um, the sales tax, or the municipal revenue sharing account, which was half of 1%, was going to be used towards uh, additional monies to give to the communities. They made up for that difference in the shortage of the ECS money to the towns. So some of the towns say, well, that's our money. And the education side is saying, well, no, no, we were cut. That's our money. So there's an intergovernment fight within the municipalities. So that's not happening in Simsbury. But those are one of the difficult things that are happening. And unfortunately, there are five communities that are represented by uh, Democrat leaders that got extra money in their ECS money for no other reason, just because they're represented by uh, Democratic leaders uh, that are in, in the leadership roles and unfortunately Simsbury is not one of them because John and I aren't in the leadership role in the Democratic majority but uh, other surrounding communities are. Yeah, Simsbury fared pretty well um, although there's cuts to transportation, uh, big cuts to transportation including non-public school transportation so our Catholic schools and private schools got hit for busing. And does the towns have to make that up, or how does that work there? Uh... The towns will make it up. Yeah. I mean, if you look at the bottom line, Simsbury is getting more money than they lost in education. So if you, if you take all the grants in aid to the municipalities, I think Simsbury came up with $120,000 more. Yeah, not much more. All averaged but, out. Not a lot more. But it did more, well compared to more. a lot of towns. You said, like Kevin said, just got, I mean, it was Madison and... Uh, One the, of the towns I represent, the uh, town of Norfolk, Oh, yeah. They lost $360,000 in education money. And there's only 1,700 residents in that town. There's no way they're going to be able to make that up. I just don't know how they're going to be able to do that. So uh, it, it wasn't fair. We haven't used a formula uh, since 2012. It's just been a straight appropriation. So to throw in a formula to try to equalize this now, it just it's not working. How about the uh, hospitals? That gained a lot of attention uh, with the hospitals. Money was being held back by the governor. Uh, there was discussion of uh, putting in provisions that uh, the money would have to be released either quarterly or, or whatever. Um, how did the hospitals fare when the smoke finally cleared? Not well. Uh, they're still struggling uh, because of a tax that we implemented a few years ago in Connecticut, which would have helped us equalize uh, reimbursement from the federal government. What happened was the state tax, we got the money, we asked for the reimbursement from the federal government, and then we kept portions of both, if not all of it, from the federal government. So these, the hospitals are being taxed at a higher rate than uh, what they're able to get for reimbursement rates on both Medicare and Medicaid. So they're struggling, and that's why you're seeing a lot of services that are generally provided out in the communities not happening as much. There's not as much outreach, and they're just really restricting to the core functions of what a hospital can do. It's, it's a sad day in Connecticut when the place where the last resort where people go to get help, in an emergency, if you will, is struggling to make ends meet. And the governor, and I, I don't understand why he would issue an executive order which has prevented two hospitals, small hospitals in Connecticut, to allow them to merge with a larger healthcare facility to help sustain their viability. And that's Day Kimball out in the eastern corner and then Charlotte Hungerford up in the northwest corner. Uh, we haven't been able to get a, a reason why the governor has put a halt to allowing these hospitals to cause an affiliation. Uh, Charlotte Hungerford was going to merge or have an affiliation with Hartford Hospital and Day Kimball was going to have one with uh, Central uh, Connecticut Hospital Care, I think that's the name of it, uh, to be able to uh, offer more and because of economies to scale they would be able to survive. But for some reason the governor issued, again, an executive order that prohibited further 
uh, affiliations of hospitals in Connecticut. Don't know why. And to, uh, to add to that, you know, devastating cuts to mental health initiatives, uh, continued uh, neglect, I feel, of the DDS system. You know, I co-chair the Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities Caucus, and, you know, we're still not fixing the wait list, and cutting DDS is really short-sighted. And, uh, you know, and again, back to mental health, just a few years after Sandy Hook, you know, we're neglecting that area, which is a key area of... Uh, I think we need to be investing in, so that was too bad. Chris? Yeah. One of the things that we're seeing is when the governor, uh, through this budget negotiations, the departments are required to cut 5.75% of their budgets. Uh, small little things are dribbling out now that we're realizing what they're doing. And one of these most recently is that municipalities are going to be required uh, to take oh, control dead. of a deceased person, their remains, if they become unclaimed. The state has always taken that yeah. on that role, but now the municipalities have gotten a, uh, a letter from the Chief Medical Examiner's Office saying that they're now required to do that. So I called the Chief Medical Examiner's Office to see how prevalent this is. And while it's not widespread, it's about 68 bodies, if you will, uh, but those communities that have that responsibility are going to have a tough time dealing with that. That's unclaimed. Because uh, they don't have the, the storage Un yeah. of, you know, if somebody dies. Yeah. And they've never uh, dealt with it before. And otherwise. secondly, which, which is coming, uh, this is uh, right off the, not even public yet, but the, um, the chief medical examiner will be writing a letter to all the police chiefs uh, within the next week or two saying, we can't do toxicology reports anymore. So you're going to have to come pick up a vial of a sample and send it out if there's a case of a DUI that um, resulted in a, in a, a death which is, for me, is absurd. It's, it's unconscionable that the state agency, it's, that's their primary focus, can't do that anymore. And police department side, I, it's just going to be a mess uh, for the state to do something like that. While other communities, they got cut $575,000, the chief medical examiner's office, out of their budget. And that's why he's claiming why they can't do this. But yet the town of West Hartford got $500,000 grant to expand their uh, broadband or go into a, a gigabyte system. So for me, uh, that weighs very heavy uh, on um, rats, if you will, that's found within legislation that because of a position you hold in the legislature, your community's given more while the rest of the state suffers. And that, these are just two small examples of how the state is suffering because of um, rats hidden in the legislature. Uh, also, let's talk uh, about second chance. Uh, the second chance proposal, the governor's second chance proposal, uh, has been for a while a two-pronged proposal. One uh, regarding the cash bail system, and the second uh, for the raise the age regarding juveniles. Um, the governor has since dropped the raise the age portion um, amidst opposition. Um, John, you've been against that. Maybe you could take us through that on the uh, the latest on second chance. Well, as we're taping, um, the bill has been uh, significantly watered down, but in the initial uh, iteration of the bill, I had grave concerns over uh, both aspects of the bill. And um, I, I am concerned about that we're not having enough conversations about victims' rights in this conversation and uh, mental health. And you know, the governor keeps talking about a second chance. I, I really want the governor and our leadership to be talking about a second chance for our state's economy and for our, those with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And I want our state to be vital again. I want there to be jobs. I want us as, a, as one of the greatest states uh, to have a second chance. And I, I don't think the governor is focused on really what's in front of us, um, which is the economy stupid and revitalizing our state. And um, I'm not supportive of this initiative. Um, you know, it was, I think we built in $15 million into the budget savings for this for a program that hasn't even been approved. I think the dollar amount is $15 yeah, million. 15, dollars, yes. Um, which I thought was sort of uh, backwards. Um, but I don't believe I'll be supporting um, the, uh, the latest iteration. Um, the cash bail uh, portion. Correct. Uh -huh. I, I don't have faith that, you know, people are just going to show up and um, I'm concerned about the, uh, the effect on public safety in our communities. Uh, for, for our viewers, I might add the uh, cash bail portion, which Kevin will talk about in a minute here, uh, the concept mainly of uh, no cash bond. In other words, if you commit a misdemeanor, you would sign a promise to appear and you would promise to appear in court. Uh, sometimes people do not appear in court. So 
Uh, Kevin is a uh, former police officer, and uh, he'll uh, discuss a little bit of that in this right now. Sure. Well, Chris, the big thing, um, I'm glad the raise the age went away because in Connecticut, the thought was we're going to treat 20-year-olds like 13-year-olds because it's thinking they don't have the mental capacity to make these decisions yet. We would allow a 20-year-old to sit on a jury trial to incarcerate uh, some, a 21-year-old on something that could be, you know, they could be sentenced to, to jail from. So that didn't make any sense. I'm glad the governor dropped that portion. But the other portion with the bail part doesn't make any sense to me either. Because the governor is saying that uh, the reason why we need this, this piece of legislation is because poor people are in jail for no other reason than they live in poverty or they're indigent. And that is so far from the truth. Because at the end of the day, a judge sets the bail. So why are we not instructing the judges to say, look at the crime, weigh the crime out, look at the ability of the person to pay, look at their prior history, and say, you're, you're being released on your own recognizance, you know, promise to appear, sign your name. Or we're releasing you on a non-surety bond, which means you don't put anything up. And if you don't show up in court, that's going to cost you X amount of dollars and you get pulled in. I don't know why we need to jump into an industry that has been working well in the state of Connecticut to do something where we already have the power to change something now. I think it's unnecessary legislation. Uh, do you think there should be a directive to the judges and let the judges handle it? In other words, is that what you're saying? Make no, make no law changes and, and give a heads up to the judges? Or are you saying leave it exactly the way it is now and, and essentially do nothing? No, I think the judges should, part of their ongoing continuing education, should learn if there's wide disparity amongst the different courthouses in Connecticut about how bail is being uh, administered, then they should have, as part of their practice book, a guideline, if you will. But a judge is one of the most powerful people in a courtroom. So why, do we, why would we want to take away that power from a judge and say, listen, make sure it's routinely applied and uh, have them part, make part of a statement on the record, in this case, as to why uh, a, bail, a monetary bail is being set, if, if it's the type of crime that we don't think should be set. But I don't think, I think we should not erode the judge's uh, discretionable abilities. Um. Go ahead, John. Sorry. And again, it just it chaps me that this is a primary focus um, why we did the cuts that Kevin referred to and that people who are born with mental illness and disabilities without their choice are forced now uh, to fend for themselves because of the, the, the harm we did through this budget. We gave away how much money to a hedge fund uh, last week, how much yeah, money? Millions. It was millions. 22 million, yes. And so, you know, without regard to the most vulnerable amongst us, I mean, I have sympathy and I do want our, our justice system to be reformed. Um, the most vulnerable amongst us are getting hurt. And we're, instead of investing now, I think we're going to pay dearly later. You know, we're, we're, we're missing the, what's the expression, forests for the trees? Or, um, and um, I, I just think our priorities are out of whack. We're having difficulty on our side of the aisle getting the information that we want to make a determination whether we really need the second chance bill or not. Because many times uh, these defendants are incarcerated on several charges, not just a one charge. And we're, we've asked the Department of Corrections to give us a listing of what all those charges are, and we can't seem to get that. Uh, sometimes you may just see the one charge, which may be the misdemeanor charge listed, but yet there could be a felony charge also on that record. And that could be, the, that's the real reason why they're being held on a cash bond, not the misdemeanor charge. So I think there's some things uh, contained within the records that the governor says is 300 and something individuals. I don't think it's that high. I, I would guess it would be a lot less. Uh, also, as mentioned here, uh, there was a 7-2 to two vote uh, by the Bond Commission to give $22 million to Bridgewater Associates. Uh, which is a hedge fund down in Westport, uh, which is known as the world's largest hedge fund. Uh, the vote was seven to two. Uh, Comptroller Kevin Lembo was against it, as well as Representative Chris Davis, a Republican. Uh, we're going to talk about that. Um, uh, both of you, uh, do you think that was uh, a bad thing? Uh, a seven to two vote, it is going to happen. Um, and uh, Bridgewater is a very, very wealthy company. Um, headed by a uh, Greenwich billionaire who runs the place. Yeah, I think uh, I give uh, Comptroller Lumbo and uh, Representative Davis credit for, for stepping up and speaking out um, against, yet again, excessive bonding. We're focusing on our wants versus our, our needs. You and I would love a pool, but 
we probably have to fix our roof first, and Connecticut needs to do that. And you go through the bonding list any given day, and there's bonding projects for schools and bridges sometimes, but then you've got $500,000 for the Thimble Museum and, you know, name the town, I don't know, St Stonington or something. And, and I love the arts and everything else, but that adds up, those little pet projects for people for softball fields and things like that, that it's, uh, it's, it gets out of control, that we're just, uh, running away on our credit card and damaging I think our our our, uh, our credit rating in the mean in the meantime and it goes against what you were talking about a bonding cap in Correct. other words you you, yeah. you in other words I, I guess there is a bonding cap of sorts it depends on soft cap. the amount of money a soft cap and a hard yeah. cap good point uh, what you're saying is you want uh, frankly set a number make it and just don't go above it correct or, or you want to lower that number I guess um, I would maybe even lower it. Um, two years ago, I put in a bill to do a moratorium on bonding unless they were infrastructure projects, okay. bridges, schools, uh, highways. Of course, that went nowhere, and nobody wants to, to talk about that. Um, because but, legislators all want bond projects in their district. Sure. In, in, in general, in yeah, general, everybody wants a new senior center in Simsbury, and uh, somebody wants a gazebo in Litchfield, and somebody even wants there's bond projects, frankly, in, in Greenwich. Um, they pay taxes too. In this last bond commission with uh, the Bridgewater Hedge Fund, uh, Greenwich got some money there, um, uh, which is part of it. The all 169 towns uh, get bond money. Is sure, what I'm and trying to say. we've gotten bond well, money and and for a senior center, and we're happy to do that. But again, it's it's focusing on our our priorities and all of us saying, you know, no, we're going to step away from the table and. One man's trash is another man's treasure. So while we may say that that's not a worthwhile project, it may be in that community that sure. it's residing in. So it makes it very difficult. But I think at the end of the day, unless the entire General Assembly says no longer, um, we'll still fight for projects within our community because for every dollar that Simsbury sends to Hartford, I think we get back nine cents. Uh, where every dollar that Hartford sends to Hartford, they get back four dollars or three dollars and seventy cents. So. Um, you fight for every little dollar you can to bring back to the taxpayers in the district. But I think also, I mean, you'd hope our municipalities, though, all of our municipalities work with us to, you know, put up projects that are dire versus, right. you know, maybe not a softball field this year, but school improvements, you know, and help us that in that regard. I mean, and not asking for projects that are, you know, too pie in the sky for our current economic climate. And, and back to the hedge fund, so are, are you both saying basically they could afford it themselves, essentially? Is, is it that simple you know, or is it not that simple? It's, it's more than that, Chris, I think, because if you look back, this is the second time that Bridgewater has appeared on the Bond Commission uh, meeting. And I, and I think the very first time was a few years ago when the governor tried it and he ended up pulling it. And that was because the owner of the hedge fund wanted the property uh, he could afford to move his company. The guy's a billionaire. He makes, I don't know how many hundreds of millions of dollars personally himself every year. But if he wanted to locate from one community in Connecticut to another community in Connecticut, he could do that at the whim. Uh, but he needed that piece of property where he wanted to go. And that's what happened uh, the first time around. So the governor caused some commotion there. And, and uh, I, th I believe that there was some eminent domain issues starting to take place. And people were very upset about that. And that's how he ruled and his mayoralship in Stanford as well. And so it kind of fell through. So now we're giving money to him for something else. I just don't know why we need to do that. I haven't been able to figure out where he's going with this. Is it because that's where he's gonna land if Hillary doesn't get elected? Or you know, trying to set himself up for when he retires? If, you know, because uh, let's face it, in the Capitol, everybody's saying if Hillary is elected president, he's going to Washington. If, he's, if she's not, what's he gonna do when he his term expires in 2018. Going to land somewhere. Guess where he's going to land? Bridgewater. Let's also discuss more broadly on the bond package, which passed 34 to 2 in the Senate. Uh, we're discussing soft bonding caps here, and, and uh, what are, what are the top projects that are? And and it is also as we tape here, pending a vote in the House, passed 34 to 2 in the Senate. Um, what are the top projects that are in the bond package, or at least in that, uh, with the caveat that the State Bond Commission has to, nothing is final until the State Bond Commission votes on it? Well, we voted for it already upstairs in the Senate, and I supported it. Uh, they removed, the, the bill actually cut a lot of the prior authorizations of, of bonding that just 
were on the books but were never going to happen. So we removed a lot of the different projects uh, that would, re would reduce the, the allocated amount. Um, this one really does school construction, um, all the infrastructure type projects. So I felt comfortable in supporting the bonding because the stuff that it's the state's responsibility to do. We saved considerable with those projects Several hundred that we did million dollars that we did yeah. not that were not allocated. So um, I anticipate voting for that. Uh, that were essentially scratched off the list. In other words, there was a lot of uh, reduction. There were there were increases. But there were a lot of decreases going back both ways. Uh, I, I believe something like nine hundred million dollars yep. was scratched off, right. but three hundred and sixty million, uh, give or take, were added back or, or added in, sure. uh, including the the state office building across from the the Bushnell down there. Is that too expensive in your mind? One hundred and eighty-one million dollars for the aging state office building, which is um, directly across the street from the Bushnell and across from the Capitol. Well, what I've asked for, I've asked from the Department of Administrative Services a listing of all the uh, buildings in downtown Hartford that are either state-occupied or state-owned or leased. Uh, because hearing uh, Mayor Bronin, when he came out and spoke to the Simsbury Chamber of Commerce last week, uh, they're struggling to make ends meet in Hartford. And if it's a state building, then guess what? They, they don't pay taxes on it. So we, can we consolidate our agencies into a um, smaller number of buildings and sell mm -hmm. the buildings we have to the private industry so that way you can start generating uh, taxable income for the city of Hartford. So I think it's if there's uh, spaces in that, I think it's 55 Elm Street that you're talking about, uh, that's vacant because of the dilapidated conditions, we should fix it up and move some more state agencies in there and start combining, consolidating and finding efficiencies and sell what we don't, the excess. Yeah, that's a good point. And there's a lot of buildings that I've been in, state buildings that are in Floors grave. are empty. Yeah. yeah, I moved down on six, is it 60 Washington, where DCP is the other day, to consumer protection, mm -hmm. across from the Bushnell. You know, that building looks like it needs more help than the LOB. Uh -huh. We uh, only have about a minute left. Um, uh, we got a political question. We're going to ask uh, Kevin how uh, the, um, there's some scuttlebutt that the Republicans could take over the Senate. Um, we've heard that for many years. Uh, the Democrats always say it's not going to happen. Um, we've been hearing that for probably a decade. Uh, what is the latest this year? Well, I'd like you to answer that question, Chris, <laughs> because being part of the, uh, the campaign committee for us, you know, we went out and we recruited some great candidates. We actually had a very easy job this time because candidates came to us. Uh, they're not happy with the direction that the state's going. Uh, they believe that this is the right time. Uh, after two huge tax increases in the state, we're still in this massive deficit, projected out to be four billion dollars or two point seven billion dollars over the next um, term. The next legislature will have to deal with. So, uh, we're we're hopeful that we will take the majority in the state senate. I think it's looking very good for us. And John, a quick word on the on the house. How is the house looking? Um, we're doing well. We're working hard and. Um you know, but there's a lot of, uh, you know, as I go travel door to door, there's a lot of, uh, and I've already started my door to door, uh, you know, especially at the national level, there's a lot of uh, chatter and anger and dissatisfaction. And um, so it's interesting conversations that we're having as we travel door to door and getting the pulse of people's uh, mood. It's definitely agitated. Yeah. That's with the whole. Uh Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton, uh, maybe that'll be a discussion of another show. Yeah, it could be a whole uh, another couple hours. It's a, uh, <laughs> well, anyway, thank you very much uh, today to our guests, uh, Senator Kevin Whitkos of Canton, who also represents Simsbury, and Representative John Hampton of Simsbury. Uh, thank you very much for watching, uh, and my name is Chris Keating. Thank you and good day. Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.